I'm happy to introduce uh, Susana Nascimento. Uh, she's going to speak uh, about from citizen science to do-it-yourself science. She sees it that a lot of citizen science is basically researchers that use citizens to collect data, and she wants to change something about that. She is a policy and foresight analyst at uh, the Joint Research Center for the European Commission and has a double PhD in philosophy and sociology. Great to have you here. <laughs> Floor is yours. Thank you, Joseph. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the organizers of the, of the track, Eugenio, Josef, and others that I don't remember the name now, yeah. but okay, thank you. Thank you for, for putting this together. Um, I'm here alone, but I'm not the only person, of course, that worked on this. Uh, I have my two other colleagues who couldn't be here, Alessia Gezi and Angela Pereira. So we worked together um, on citizen science and what we call the, the do-it-yourself science. So next slide, please. So you have a lot of terms to, 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 to say citizen science. You have amateur science, crowdsourced science, street science, networked science, crowd science, citizen cyber science. So a lot of these terms now are, you could say that are very technologically based. And that's why uh, a current paradigm that's getting a lot of traction and a lot of strength right now is the um, citizens as sensors. Uh, and this is the basis of many citizen science projects that you see in a very big scale. Uh, next slide, please. So here you have We Sense It, which is a big European project. Uh, this focuses on citizens you know, capturing information on water environments, including flood risk, uh, and they use a combination of uh, sensors, um, uh, social media, and, and an app. Um, but really, we need to go in a little bit deeper on what does it mean, citizen science. And here, um, you see a lot of terms. If we, when we went through, me and my colleagues went through the, liter the literature and the projects that are going on on citizen science, you still he uh, hear a lot of expressions like uh, amateurs, uh, trained observers, non-scientists, non-experts. Um, and just by the terminology, you can see that there is still, you can go on, there is still a lot of, uh, a big gap between experts and non-experts. And citizens sometimes are very much seen as only data collectors or just performing a lot of tasks that are very time consuming or very costly. And that is something that is, uh, unfortunately, um, in some big projects are go is going on. And also, sometimes citizen science is just another fancy word <laughs> to, um, to designate the sort of you know, um, dissemination, just pure dissemination of results or um, scientific literacy or educating the public about science. Um, and another thing that when you have this gap between science or experts and non-experts, you can see that there's a lot of um, understanding that science is the only legi legitimate and reliable source of knowledge, which of course cuts off many different ways of knowing that need to be merged. And I was, uh, I was inspired by, by your this tale that we are all experts in our own or in our own dimensions of our lives. And in the end, if you, if you see citizen science only in, through that perspective, in, in a sort of gap that's still going on, you limit cit uh, citizen's agency. So um, there is no way that uh, they have a meaningful or, or even uh, leveled contribution to the, the big science. And another thing that is missing is also mm, there's no mechanisms of extended peer review. So the results are not are not being um, are not being checked by by citizens that are cut off from that part of most of the times that are cut off from that part of the research, and there's an all, uh, no mechanism to ensure the impact on the communities that are involved in those projects. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So maybe we can 
take a look uh, at one possible typology or classification, what you want to call it, on citizen science. You have the level one, which is a crowdsourcing, uh, citizens and si uh, sensors. There's absolutely nothing more than just data collection. The level two, which is like a more distributed intelligence, citizens are um, um, introduced or serve as basic interpreters, but there's nothing more uh, going on. And level three, you can talk about participatory science. There's already a bit participation in the problem definition on the data collection, of course, but the problem definition is the more important uh, part of this uh, level. And level four, which is the extreme science, and here is, um, is the work uh, that uh, the topology here is the Hackley, which is the extreme science um, center um, in UCL, and they are talking about the collaborative science where there's problem definition, there's data collection, there's analysis, the whole cycle is there for everyone. Of course, um, this is when citizen science is still very much uh, coming from the scientific world. In level four, in, in, in extreme, you can, in the, what they call extreme science, that's where you start looking at citizens actually performing the science with no distinctions between scientists or non-scientists. Um, yeah, next, next slide. So you have a lot of good, interesting things going on in what we could call do-it-yourself science. You, you have a lot of people, uh, individuals, groups, communities, uh, performing, um, uh, creating stuff, uh, uh, usually in open source platforms or tools using and in outside the conventional research centers, doing it in maker spaces and fab labs and uh, DIY bio uh, uh, labs. Uh, one example is the Amplino is a startup which has uh, produced a um, uh, diagnostic device for uh, malaria. Uh, next one. Uh, another good example is the public lab, which is a community of educators, of, of, um, of organizers, of activists, of, uh, that they, they do um, develop open source platforms and tools for environmental uh, exploration. Uh, one of their... Um, yeah. <laughs> One of their projects was the balloon mapping, uh, which mapped out um, Spanish territories that were affected by the, um, the um, how do you call it, the, the real estate bubble. Um, and uh, it was a very interesting uh, workshop that they did. They are doing it all over the world. Another, another next one, please. You have uh, another example, very different purpose, the Space Gambit, which is a uh, a U.S. program that finances um, spatial technologies, uh, everything from space habitats, like the one you see here, the Space Earth ship, to satellite development. Um, of course, uh, there's th interesting things to discuss also in, in do-it-yourself science. For example, the space gambit, it, it came to a bit of a controversy uh, because it is a, f a program financed by DARPA. And maybe the most visible controversy in terms of the funding, of the source of the funding for this, for this project was the, um, when uh, the O'Reilly Media, um, the organizers of the Maker Fair, uh, they accepted um, a grant from DARPA to extend the Maker Movement. And one of the, Mitch, Mitch Altman, one of the co-founders of the San Francisco Hackerspace, Noise Bridge, he, he uh, very publicly expressed his disagreement. Uh, next slide. And he said, you know, that um, it's a very strong statement. Children who are educated with DARPA funding are m probably more likely to think that DARPA is a good thing and are more likely to work for DARPA or other military organizations. Is this a good trade off? I don't think so. So Altman, in the end, he argued for alternative source of funding from organizations or other foundations that would be better aligned with the goals of the maker community. Another example came from the Fab Lab community, uh, which accepted recently a 10, min, a 10 million grant from Chevron. So um, the DIY Bio also faces very interesting dilemmas, and they're very, I think they're more active than others and trying to face on these challenges and in terms of, you know, uh, governance models, um, 
in terms of biosafety, transparency, legal norms, or even the codes of ethics. Um, next one, and you can see very interesting that you know the code of ethics that were being produced um, in 2011, I think. Um, even the uh, Eggleston made a very quick analysis of you know these are important issues that need to be think about. You know, uh, we need to discuss it, the transparency, the open access, the peaceful purposes. These are all things that. Uh, need to be discussed. Um, so, just in conclusion, next one, I think there are some imp points that we can further discuss this, the, in terms of self-regulation or what kind of regulation do you want. Self-regulation sometimes um, has problems, of course, in um, has problems in uh, if it's, if it's effective, uh, what are the limits? Where do we need more, more uh, precautionary or proactionary? Where, does, where, does, where do those all fit? The funding, I give some examples of the funding, and of course, you know, the f freedom and the freedom to innovate um, sometimes is um, cl clashes against what are the sources of funding. If you accept funding from certain organizations, uh, that freedom can be uh, very much limited or not maybe formally, but informally you will get more limits on talking public about things uh, and, and other things. Inclusion and diversity is a very important point for the do-it-yourself science because we're opening up everything, but we need to think about questions of power, of gender, of disparities, of social and cultural capital, of uh, know-how, of access. And also a transdisciplinary approach is what I think is, it's the sort of blurring of knowledge, of all kinds of knowledge being together. And of course we can discuss how can we do this. And uh, this is an important, important, important point that I'm very interested also. So thank you.